Hey everybody, welcome. This is Dr. Levi with your show, The Dr. Levi Show. We have an extraordinary day planned for you, and I'm so grateful that you're taking your morning to enjoy it with us. So, on the docket today, we have like an amazing woman who really has shown the essence of of what it is to be of service to a community and to the United States. So I'm going to tell you about her shortly. I want to remind everyone that this is the closing part of Black History Month, where we really take an opportunity to to honor all of those who've had such an extraordinary impact being African American, and more importantly, those that have helped to to change this country's insights and to make the country a better place. As per usual, I want to say it's beautiful here in Los Angeles today, a little bit chilly, but not that bad. And I want to remind you, wherever you are, make sure you're making it a great day. Why? Because every day is a gift. And remember, the first gift that we have is our health. So you want to do what you can to maintain your health. When it comes to exercise and diet and decreasing stress and mindfulness, taking time every day to either pray or meditate, but just to sit in the stillness of gratitude, knowing that every day is a gift and that every day is a day that you can do something to help other people. It's all about service. Why do you want to get fit? Not simply to have a a six pack or to have great abs and great arms. Well, that, that's part of it, but that's the aesthetic. The deeper, more profound part about fitness is that you want to be fit so that you can be of service to other people and so that you can stave off the issues of diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, stroke, heart attack, different forms of, of cancer. That's why we want to get fit. You want to break that legacy that your family maybe says, well, my daddy had it, my mama had it, so I'm going to have it too. Well, what about doing something to change ourselves genetically on a cellular level. How can we do that? Well, it's via diet and exercise and mindfulness. So take time to really think about these things, not only during Black History Month, no, but for the rest of your life, because you want to have a healthy body. Why? Because you take you wherever you go. So you want to have a you that's healthy and happy, that you can ambulate well, you can walk without pain, that you can sit and stand and see and do things with your body. You have to honor your body. How do you do that? By being healthy and by being mindful of your diet. It's about commitment, consistency, diet, exercise, rest, and recovery. I want you to really embrace that as a lifestyle. It's not about a diet. All the diets are very controversial. However, eating properly Eat the best way that you can. And how do you do that? By minimizing fat, salt, sugar, all those things. You already know they taste good, but they're not good for you. So ask yourself the following when you're going to make that choice. I want it, but do I need it? And also, I often think about that. I think it's a tribute to, to the model Kate Moss who said that nothing tastes as good as fitness feels. And I've always loved that because it's really true. What could you eat that's going to taste as good as feeling good is? You know, you want to feel good about your life and about your body because you only get one. So you want to make sure that you maximize your health. It's really important. The medical moment for today is simply about stillness. I really want you to consider every day to take 15 minutes to sit in gratitude, to relax your mind, to de-stress, to not think about finances, to not think about people that you work with, to not think about the next day, to simply sit in a state of stillness, knowing and believing that you're here for a purpose, that you are worthy, and that no one needs to validate your life but you, period. I want you to consider this following statement, you are enough period. You don't have to have anything added to that. You're perfect just the way you are. Why? Think about this. In the universe, there's only one of you, at least one of you that we know of. So how wonderful is that? So you want to love every, every freckle, every frown, every, every wrinkle. Just love all of your body and appreciate your body just the way it is. Now, with that said, what a day. We have the ineffable here, the great congresswoman, Karen Bass. So let's, let's talk about, about some of her many achievements. She has been Speaker of the House here in California. She is the Congresswoman for the 37th District, which was redistricted from 33rd to 37th. Uh, she is a graduate in philosophy. She's attended Cal State Dominguez Hills. She has been someone who has really been at the forefront of getting people involved in making a difference. Well, how do you make a difference? By executing your right to vote. If you're a millennial, 
if you're a, a, a post millennial like, like I am, you still want to vote. And it can't be simply about complaining about things. It's not about the complaints that make a difference. It's the power of the pen. It's the power of making a call to your Congress people. It's about making a difference through legislation. That's how we make changes. You know, someone recently asked me, how do I vote? And I always tell them, I vote when I'm thinking about the person of how they're going to put people on the bench on the Supreme Court. That's how I vote. I don't simply think about, you know, uh, you know, liberal or Democrat or Republican, you know, as a Democrat that I am, yes, I do think about those things, but I'm also thinking about who is going to be placed on that court that may have generational changes with the law, generational. So that impact is phenomenal to me. So it's not about voting for someone to me because you like the way they look or because you like some of the things that they espouse. Because often what we find in politics is someone may espouse one thing, but then when they get into office, they can be very different. Look at our current president. Trump is very different from Trumpism. So with that said, not saying either of them are good either, and no judgment about it, but they're, they're, they're different. With that said, I'm grateful today that, you know, in celebration of Black History Month, we have someone who will really be a part of the legacy of making legislative change. So welcome, Congresswoman Karen Bass. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on your show today. It, it, it's really wonderful to have you. You know, you made such an impact in so many lives because you're really about spurring hope and also reminding people that they have to vote. Exactly. Absolutely. It's so important. And, you know, the same with you. You are so inspirational. Oh, I listen thank you. to your medical moment and I'm going to oh. definitely take, that, well, to, thank you. take thank you. that to heart. But yes, you know, I think that there is nothing more important that you can do civically to be a citizen yes. than to vote. Absolutely. And it's our responsibility. And, and especially if you're thinking about Black History Month, People died Absolutely. for our right to vote. Absolutely. And it's not something that you take for granted. And now that we're learning all of the intrigue and mystery around the last election, you know, we never imagined that another country could actually interfere in our right to vote. Absolutely. And so I think the next time we go to a vote, which in California will be in June, yep. You know, we will view that a little more with, with a little more caution and yes. deliberation because, again, we never thought that somebody could actually interfere. Influence. Yeah. Absolutely. And when you talked about voting, it made me think about my grandmother, you know, until her late 80s when she became very, very disabled. You know, I went home to New Orleans to see her and it was right. At, it was voting day. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, well, you know, I, I'm sorry you can't go and vote. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I know you don't feel well. She said, boy. <laughs> go get my cane, go get the chair, we're going to vote. Exactly. I said, well, you don't feel well. She said to me, as long as I have breath, and you remember this, Levi, as long as you have breath, you vote. Exactly. And she did it. Exactly. So it is really important. It is a civic duty. But as you said so eloquently, people have died for us to have the right to vote, That's right. for women to vote, for us as African Americans to vote. This is not something that should be taken lightly on any surfaces. That's right. And, you know, I, I know you had asked me before how I got involved. And, you know, when I was young, I was a, a kid here in Los Angeles. I didn't grow up in the South. I grew up right here. And I watched the civil rights movement with my father every evening on right. the news. And I saw people dying. I yes. saw people being beat. Yes. I saw the protests. I saw the dogs. Yes. And those folks were fighting for our right to yes. vote. They were fighting for equality. And I grew up with this incredible sense of responsibility that if they did that yes. to lead the way for me, then it was my obligation to make a commitment to spend the rest of my life fighting to extend what they were doing, Absolutely. fighting for social and economic justice, right. which we've also learned in recent history. You know, you might think you've won something today, but you don't necessarily think about it could be taken from you tomorrow. Absolutely. So you have to be vigilant, and it's a lifelong effort. Very much so. And one thing that I love that your platform is about, it's about getting people involved, not only to, to vote, but also to be mindful about the power of the vote. You're not just voting because everyone else is voting. You're voting because it's the right thing to do because you want to instigate change. You want to, you want to make the country better. You don't want the, the status quo to, to be maintained. You want, to, you want to enrich your life and enrich generations of lives. Exactly. And, you know, many times people feel, well, I'm just one person. How could I possibly make a difference? But I don't know if you remember, Doctor, that there was an election just a few months ago in Virginia. 
and it was a tie vote. Yes, I remember and that. And they actually flipped a coin to see who was going to take right. the seat. Right. Can and you believe so that? that election was was one vote. One vote. Absolutely, right. it right. made a difference. It really does. You know, what about your life, you know, as a child growing up here in California? What was the, you'd say, when you grew up, who were the heroes in your life that really brought about you to, to have this thought in your mind that I want to get involved in politics, I want to live a life of service? Well, you know, on the big stage, of course, it was it was Dr. King. Yes. It was Bobby Kennedy. Yes. Bobby Kennedy's uh, presidential campaign was the first time I was involved, and I was just in middle school during wow. that time. But you know, that's that's on the national front. Right. But there were a lot of people in the neighborhood right. who were older, who were political activists in their generation, right. and they saw in me my interest in politics. Right. They took me under their wing, they mentored me, they nurtured me, and they kept me in the right path. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because without our elders and without our mentors, we could easily go to in the oh, wrong direction. Oh, absolutely. You know, and they we always say it takes, a, it takes a village. It absolutely. And I had that village. Right. Unfortunately, they're all gone now. But, but you, you know, remain. Absolutely. I remain. And then now I have the honor of playing that role myself. Absolutely. And so I have been very honored to work with young people uh, starting back 28 years ago when I started Community Coalition. Yes. We started recruiting high school students. And uh, because I was a high school student as an activist, I believe that young people have the ability to bring about change. And as a matter Mm -hmm. of fact, Right now, while we're doing this show, young people are doing just that. They're having a protest on the grounds of the White House about gun control. Right. And they're high school students and college students. So I worked with a, a cohort of young people in South Central Los Angeles. 28 years later, they're right. still there. And now they've nurtured a whole nother generation. Right. So I'm very honored to be in the role now. I think that's wonderful because it also shows that you are leaving this legacy of Two things, advocacy yes. and activism. Absolutely. And you have to have both of those. Absolutely. It can't see, simply be about the talk of it. You have to get involved. And, and let me just say about that, you know, uh, everything you say about the vote that we're talking about, of course, course is correct. But I want to take it a step further. Yes. Because in addition to the vote, once you make your mark in your polling area, you do have to stay involved. And, you know, yes. I had an experience, doctor, when I was elected. Yes. As all the years I had spent being an activist and all the people that helped me get elected, yes. once I got elected, they all kind of said, oh, bye, go mm-hmm. off, do well. Because yeah. part of our American culture, we're not a very political society. True. And we kind of elect people to office and then think that they're supposed to be godlike. Right, right. And it right. actually takes your continued involvement. Right. It's not enough just to elect people. You've got to stay involved in the community. I agree. And also I think they have to let the elected officials know what change that we want to have yes. done. Yes. You know, it can't be a, okay, I got you there. Okay, you got it. Okay, bye. Exactly. Well, what, do you, what do you want from me now? I'm here, exactly. you know, but I, now I want to be your voice. You're right. the voice of the community. You know, I'll, I'll share this with you. In 2010, when you were running, I was actively involved in raising funds for you. Oh. Never met you. But I knew you were a voice of change. (laughs) And that was, you know, eight years ago. Uh And you're still here, still making a difference, Mm -hmm. and still living this authentic life of change. I really think it's admirable. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was was on (laughs) boots to the ground. We have to be involved. Just like when, you know, this past presidential election, I had so many friends say, oh, Levi, I'm not even going to vote. It was like, how can you say that to me? I, you know, I'm somebody who's deeply entrenched in politics and political thinking. As an aficionado of pop culture, you have to be involved. To make culture better, you have to be involved. You can't simply be an outsider, or I call a non-participant, and then complain. Exactly, exactly I, right. I, how is that? That doesn't make sense to exactly me. Exactly right. And, you know, I believe that, you know, as an elected official, it's my job to be accountable to the people Absolutely. who've elected me. Absolutely. And so I have town hall meetings all the time. I always enjoy that. Right. But I usually at every town hall meeting spend a good half of the time teaching civics. Yes. Because in addition to our culture not being one that is very much involved, we know what all the celebrities are doing. but. Right. 
we don't know who our elected official is. Right. We don't know right. who represents us, right. nor do we understand what the different levels of government do. Correct. And so I'll have a town hall meeting and people will want to talk to me about barking dogs. I say, well, that is actually a city issue right. and I'm in Washington, D.C. Right. Totally different. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's not enough because people often say, well, you know, they took this out of high schools. But, you know, I mean, how long ago did you go to high school? Exactly it, it's right. something that you need to do in an ongoing basis. True. And I think we have to continue to educate people because many people, even one of my neighbors just recently, who I was talking to her, she's 14 years old, and we started talking politics. And I said, well, you know, tell me about the, the different branches of government. She said, well, I don't know what those are. I said, well, one is executive. What are the other two? She said, I can't remember. I said, well, I'll give you a hint. Another one is legislative. She said, I don't know. I could not believe this teenager had no... Who's in school. Who's in school, <laughs> right. She said, I've been out for many years. Had, when I say no clue, no clue, right. and her dad was standing there, and then he said to me, he said, Levi, you know, history and all that stuff, is not, that's all politics, it's not really important. So I called him Ooh. on it, and I called him on in front of his daughter. I said, yeah. you know, it's really important. Yeah. You want her to be someone who's thinking about things outside the box and not just being fed what everybody says is okay. I said, no, it, it's important. Right, it's it important. absolutely is important, right. and I I always study history because not much is new. Nah, oh, I well, agree. we're going through now is kind of new. Well, this is new, yeah. This is a, this is a new kind <laughs> but, of, uh, but not much dynamic. is, right. and it's really important to learn from history because right. then you can learn what happened, what worked, what didn't work. Absolutely, at that particular time. Absolutely, you know, I want to talk about some real hot topics right now. One, of course, is gun control. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you think about that we should be thinking of that you could do legislatively to make a difference with respect to gun control? Well, we, that's another thing that we need to think about in our American culture because right. we have more guns than any other country, right. you know, on the planet. Right. But yet there are other countries that do have a lot of guns, but they do not have the level of violence we do. Right. And it's something that really needs to be uh, thought Addressed. about. I agree. There's a lot of things that can be done legislatively. Right. You know, for example, background checks. Absolutely. I mean, actually, one of the things that happened earlier this year is my, my colleagues passed legislation to loosen restrictions on gun laws for people who are mentally ill. Another uh, law that was passed was, well, fortunately, it hasn't made it all the way up to the president, but it says that if you're from a state where it's okay to carry guns and you get on an airplane and travel to another state, you should be able to follow the laws from the state that you came from which is really kind of chaotic. Very much so. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. Background checks yes. is one. Yes. The system for background checks needs to be updated and automated right. because you can do a background check but not necessarily know. Someone can go to 10 go gun stores in a day, Absolutely. have background checks, but they don't necessarily cross-reference. Absolutely. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. But unfortunately, we are blocked from doing them right now. Right now. Because the National Rifle Association is an extremely powerful lobby. It's a, it's po they have powerful lobbyists and so much money behind them. Exactly. As you know, as well as I do, in Congress, it's really about who has the most amount of money to get the biggest push through with their lobbyists and who can get their voices heard. It well, doesn't mean these are voices that are good for right, the country, right. but they and, get them heard. And so the NRA gives everyone a report card. And um, if you live in some districts and you don't have an A from the NRA, you're in trouble. Okay, so from my no district, money coming your way. well, and the voters look at you differently. Well, from course. my district, if I didn't have an F, I'd be in trouble. Yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's the only F I've been proud of. Absolutely, <laughs> isn't that an interesting dichotomy though? When an F in that in that instance actually means success versus yes. an A, which means that you have some major issues going on. Yes, an yeah. F may, means that I voted against all of the laws to loosen gun, gun restrictions. restrictions. You know, what are the thoughts about having psychiatric evaluations for people? I know many have said that it's not possible because of the volume of people that would need that. But I would think that some type of, of assessment should be done for people before they can carry a gun. And I'm often thinking, why should anyone have access to a semi-automatic rifle? Well, there's why? no need for them. You don't hunt with an AR-15. No, no, no. You, no, you do not. Except for, unless you're hunting people. Correct. And that's what we've seen over and over. Exactly. And so the young man that um, carried out the massacre a few days ago, oh, yeah, in he had all sorts yeah. of red flags. Right. All sorts of red flags. People had called about him. Right. He had had a history 
history, you know, of mental illness. And he even had posts on YouTube that said, I want to be a professional school shooter. Exactly. That that if that's not a dauntingly cryptic uh, scary message. Right. I don't know what is. Right. And, you know, all of the officials were notified. My my colleagues, unfortunately, that, that allow the gun laws to be loosened always talk about the need for mental health whenever there is a shooting like this. The problem is they will not put funding behind it. Behind it. They raise it rhetorically, but when it comes to the resources to actually provide mental health services, they won't do they, it. No, they won't even allow it to be voted on. Wow. Well, what are, what are the th- if Oh, you, you were... know one other thing, yes, by the ma'am. way, sure. that's very, which should be interesting to sure. you. They also will not allow medical research. So you know that the Centers for Disease Control are prohibited from researching gun violence. Now, I read about that, which I, I still find phenomenally crazy. <laughs> There's no word for exactly, that. You know, no. how, why, no why would you not provide research and funding to get an idea about what's going on there? That They will not allow yeah, research. That, there's, there's no words for that. You know, if you were speaking to the president right now specifically, what would you tell him about gun control that you would like to see implemented specifically? What are well, the top three I, things you would the, tell him? The one thing that I would tell him is, is that you have uh, spoken about mental health. Please put resources in mental health. Right. Background checks, yes. strengthen them, yes. and automate the system. I agree. With Those that. would be the top three. Automate things. it and update it regularly, right? Because we have the technologies now right. for that. Oh yeah, it's not but like it's not applied. It's not right. It's not applied. Nope. But it's not like this is two thousand, or I should say eighteen fifteen. You know, this is twenty eighteen. We have all the resources. And no. and actually, President Obama did try to change that because that did not require legislation. Right. So he did move to update the system and to automate it and all, but it was reversed. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really, I, I think it's so interesting how the the current executive branch of, of our country is so diametrically opposed to almost everything President Obama did. And you have to think why, because everything Obama did was not bad at all. You know, he did what he could to really institute changes that would hopefully cause generations to live better and to be more safe. So it's not not clear to me why that dynamic even exists. And it's so steadfast. Right. And I, it's actually an obsession. But it's an obsession that started before this administration took over. Because right. if you think about it, you know, the president did lead the campaign questioning oh, yes. where President Obama was born. Right. Even, call, even questioning his academic achievements, achievements saying yes. we need to see his transcripts. Right. So I think he's been obsessed for a long time. But... Doctor, sometimes when people feel inadequate, yes. they do tend to be obsessed behind somebody that they feel might be superior. And threatened by. And yep. threatened. Well, let's just, let's just hope that change comes appropriately and through our vote and through awareness. I think when we're aware, we can make changes. Um, let's talk about DACA. Yes. You know, because I think that's another hot button issue that we have to address because especially here in California, we have so many dreamers that are looking for not only asylum and sanctum, but looking for a place to thrive and to participate actively, to pay taxes, to be a part of the conversation. And I think DACA is a way that we can enhance their opportunities to be a part of the narrative of what America is about. Exactly. And and actually what we were just talking about in terms of the obsession around Obama, a DACA is an example because because some people actually think that there is a crisis around DACA. There really isn't, because the president could have just left it alone. He chose to end the program, which created a crisis. So there's just a a little difference between Dreamers and DACA. DACA um, are young people who actually stepped forward and registered with the government and said, I am here without papers. I want to become a citizen. Right. Dreamers is a broader category because hundreds of thousands of young people did not step forward for one reason or another. And so in March, because President Trump decided to end the program, he set the date that it ends on March 6th. So we need to pass legislation to extend it or the other way that it might happen is through the courts. So right now, courts on two levels 
have ruled against the president. Those are both federal courts said he has to. They, they said he instigate. cannot end the program. Right. So one more level, which is the Supreme Court, yes. and the Supreme Court has agreed to take the case up. So my fingers are crossed that right. the Supreme Court will rule the right way, yes. which then will take the issue of DACA away from Congress. Because frankly, as long as we have it, we're going to mess it up. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but, but I think the mess up maybe, Congressman Bass, I'd like to hear what you think about that, uh, is because of who's in power right now, who's yep. in charge right now. I think if there were a greater balance, then maybe the conversation would be, would have a different texture and tone. But right now it is, it is one that is so vociferous and so filled with hatred and um, racism. The racial overtones are just unbelievable to me right now. Well, that, that goes back to the civics lesson of a lot of people do not realizing that there's one party that controls every branch of government. Correct. And when you have one party controlling everything, the other party controls nothing. Right. And so the, the problem that they see with DACA is they do not want the young people to become citizens, and they don't want them to become citizens for really a political reason, which is they're afraid that they will become Democrats. Right. Since the majority right. of the young people, not all of them, but right. the majority of them are young people of color, and they right. are not just Latinos. No, they're, they're not Latinos, just, they're Latinos, they're Asians, they're Mexicans, absolutely. they are uh, Africans, right. a lot of African right. countries. They're from the Caribbean, right. they're European um, so the perception is is that if you let all of these people in, they will register as Democrats. And, and they will vote against. And they will vote yeah. against uh, the Republicans. And then the right. racial angle is is there is a segment of our country that is very uncomfortable with the browning of America. Right. Which is why the president said he would welcome immigrants from Norway. And it was funny. You know the Norwegians right. said, no, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, 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 isn't that interesting? <laughs> they said, isn't we're that doing just fine. Exactly, by ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, you know I, I, I really, you know, I, I, I so appreciate you being here because it really opens the conversation about how do we change the narrative legislatively? And I think we do that by having really great, wonderful voices who really hold a torch of light like yourself. And you Thank do you. it unapologetically, and you do it fearlessly. You do it as a woman, you do it as an African-American woman. And that takes a lot, because your journey has not been easy, and you, as you already know, may not be easy. Right, right, right. But you know, one thing is, is that it's easy to think about all of the conflicts that we have in D.C., but there are issues that we work together on, right. and uh, but they never are considered newsworthy, so you never right. hear about them. Exactly. So, for example, one of the issues that I work a lot on is the child welfare system, the foster care system. Yes. I work very closely with my Republican colleagues. My, my number one uh, Republican partner is a major supporter of the president. And uh, we work very well. We With no issue. Talk, no, we, we talk about the young people. When Obama wow. was in, he didn't talk about Obama. I don't talk about Trump. <laughs> right, we talk right, about the kids. Right. And we that's do it. just fine. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and we were able to pass legislation. As a matter of fact, just a couple of weeks ago when the budget bill passed, yes. you remember when the government oh, shut yeah, down for down. a few mm -hmm. hours? Uh, well, in that bill was a right. major piece of child welfare legislation wow. uh, making some needed reforms to the system. Right. Another issue that I work on uh, that I know you'll find Until interesting Monday is bipartisan edition, is African-related policy. Mm -hmm. And so Africa is a very bipartisan bipartisan issue. African Americans aren't always bipartisan. Correct. Ish isn't a bipartisan correct. issue. But that is you know, correct. but the but the continent of Africa right. is. Very much so. And so even given the the very disparaging words, you know, that the president had to say about Congress, yes. I mean about Africa. About Africa, about the it whole entire does continent. Not the entire continent, which clearly he doesn't know very much about. <laughs> no, of course. Uh, but correct. that is not the way Congress no. feels. No, and not so at all. you know we I don't think the majority of Americans or people on the planet feel that way about the Exactly. Either. Exactly. No, that that's right. And yeah. so, you know, that was very embarrassing. Yes. And I had to go on behalf of Congress and the American people and apologize. Oh, yes. uh, you know, the um, uh, the ambassadors from Africa and there's 55 of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, have a headquarters in Washington, D.C. The African Union has yes. a headquarters. And I went over and met with all 55 ambassadors and apologized. Oh, it was necessary. It, you know, it was necessary. Oh. But I have been apologizing a lot lately. Right. Oh, yeah, <laughs> For believe. the last 13 months, I've right, been apologizing right. to you people know, from overseas. You know, I think it's, <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts? You know, when we look at uh, an executive branch that many consider has overtones of misogyny and and racism and 
uh, anger and ego. You know, when 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 you as a congresswoman look at that branch of government, what are the things that you are thinking that you have to institute to keep your bearings? No matter what's going on in the executive branch, that right. storm, right. how do you keep the calmness of Karen Bass focus on not the tweets, you know, right. but on what needs to be done? How do how do you how do you how do you tow that? Because it's a lot. Right, it is. But you know, when I come home, I mean I live in DC for four days, I live in LA for three days. When I come home, you know, it is about the folks in the community who always ground me. I know why I'm there. I know what I'm doing. And so regardless of the madness that's happening right now, uh, I stay, I keep my eyes on the prize. That's one of my mottos. Yes. I keep my eyes on the prize. Yes. The other thing that's an interesting dynamic about Congress is that presidents come and go. That's true. That's <laughs> Congress true. Congress stays there. Yes, that's true. And that's so, true. you know, uh, it is a heartbreak, though, because I did have seven years of just, you know, incredible admiration and, you know, really appreciating and respecting going over to the White House. Oh, and now it's kind of it's not a lot. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you this way. Um, you know, if you want to go to the White House, you can call my office and we'll set up a White House tour. And we were always, you know, inundated. And now n hardly anyone calls. Really? No, hardly anyone. I think in the last year I may have had maybe five or ten requests. For the year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for people to go to the White House versus five or ten a day. Wow. People are just, you know, not feeling it, as they say. At all, <laughs> not feeling it. Yeah. Wow, that's really, uh, yeah. that's surprising. It is. But, you know, this this day shall pass. I mean, wow. you see, that's why history is so important. Wow. Yeah, because history will tell you it really does. that, I mean, I remember a few presidents yeah. ago that I thought yeah. the world was going to end. Right, right. And I, I've been around long enough to know that this day will pass. Right. And that one thing that we should all be comforted by, our country is really strong. Oh, very our true. Our institutions are very strong. Very true. And one individual, I don't care who you are, right. including the president, yes. you cannot bring us down. Right. And that's right. a very important thing because as I work on Africa-related issues, yes. that's not th the same. And, and I had to also share this with the ambassadors. I told them, I said, let me acknowledge that we're in a very unstable period in our country. Right. But we are not going to fall. Not at all. There's a lot of African countries right. because they're very new. You can have the situation we're in now and the entire country collapses. Can collapse. Absolutely. But you know, the African governments, their governments are about 40, 50, 60 years old. So right. if you're going to judge Africa, you have to look at us Absolutely. when we were in the early 1800s. Absolutely. Totally <laughs> that, different. That's that's yeah. the comparison. Cuz our infrastructure now is totally different. But we've been around you know, for 200 plus, plus years. years. Exactly right. You know, one thing I think about with with everything that goes with the executive branch right now is that no matter what, no one, not even the president, no one is a is above the law. The law stands. The Constitution stands. And I think for myself personally, that always gives me a place of solace knowing that no matter what, the law will still keep everything and everybody in check. Um, you look at the recent indictments right now. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that? Because those are very impactful. And I think they show us that a lot of things will come down the pike now with respect to the honesty or lack thereof of what went on with the Russian investigation, with the Russian uh, collusion issues. Right. And I do think that the president is struggling to understand that he's not above the law. I mean, I, I think that in his past right. as a businessman, right. he was able to disregard a lot of things, you know, because they all wound up in court. Right. But that's not the same. No, not now. And he's he's struggling very right. much to understand and learn what his role is. Absolutely. Uh, but the indictments um, are very profound. And, and I will tell you, it goes back to that first issue we were talking yes. about. One of the most shocking things in the indictments was how the Russians were actually trying to convince people not to vote and were just wrecking havoc. Wow. in our country. And wow. so some of those protests, and one protest I remember very specifically, right. it was a, a pro-Trump rally where they had an actress in a cage and she was supposed to be Hillary and wow. they were doing lock her up. Really? Yes, and yes, it was yes. a woman in a cage. Wow. That whole thing was funded and everything by the Russians. Wow. The whole thing was staged by the Russians. They did a whole campaign to that targeted targeting African American millennials to convince them not to vote, and telling them, well, you know, they called Hillary Hillary. That wow. came from the Russians. Wow. 
And they were very specific things they were doing. So I am not a lawyer, but in reviewing the indictments with a, a friend of mine, uh, who in fact is a judge, was pointing out that a lot of it is essentially laying a case of money laundering because the Russians were feeding. They were spending $1.2 million a month to influence our elections a through month. social media. Wow. So a lot of the pro-Trump and anti-Trump rallies that you saw some of those were organized and and pushed by by, the Russians. by Russians. Yeah, that so is. It, you know, and it, it's it's a lesson for all of us because as as we all embark on this new technology yeah. that people in my generation struggle right, <laughs> struggle right. with, uh, we don't we didn't really yeah. realize that it could be used against Absolutely. us. Absolutely, we never thought about that. Right now, we have to think about what are the firewalls we need to put up, what are the security measures right. because cybersecurity has to be a true focus right now, especially for the interim or midterm elections coming up, we have to think about what can well, we do to protect this. So here's one thing that I, I think is profoundly sad, is that when the indictments came down, they laid out in 37 pages all of the ways that there was an attack on our country. Wow. The commander-in-chief did not defend us. The commander-in-chief talked about himself wow. and all weekend long has tweeted about himself. We passed sanctions against Russia six months ago that he refuses to enact. So could you imagine if the country was bombed and the president comes out and says, well, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> it's like, right. hello. Right, right. So, you know, once again, all of that, we have to realize if the Russians are trying to discourage us from participating, my hope is that will energize us Absolutely. because we should be outraged that somebody would want to influence right. our country in that manner. And then what do we do to stop it? That's the right. thing. What about prevention? So, so let me tell you that uh, one of my colleagues, Benny Thompson, who is the lead Democrat on the Homeland Security Committee, has put forward legislation trying to um, fi provide funding of around $2 billion to shore up our election process. We have to. The question will be whether or not my colleagues allow the bill to even be voted on. So I will so tell even you. even get to the floor. I will even get to committee. Oof. I will tell you that in the last 13 months, absolutely nothing has been done to shore up the, the democratic process in our country. They are completely refusing to do that because from their point of view, whatever the Russians did or didn't do worked in their favor. Now, you could think about that because it might have worked in their favor today. That doesn't but mean it won't time. tomorrow. But, you know, the fact that wow. the Russians specifically go after race. Specifically. Specifically, because they know it's wow. the Achille, Achilles Hill oh, in the United so. States. Very much so. That tells you a lot of how they're really studying our culture. Right. And how they're studying the, the undercurrents of our society which are not necessarily the ones that should be lauded or appreciated, but they're aware of them. You well, know, they, they want to exploit them. They know that there's a percentage of folks in this country that are concerned about the browning of America. Wow. They knew that there were people who never accepted that there was an African-American family on Pennsylvania Avenue. Right. And they did everything in their power to stoke that. Right. And, and still unfortunately, continue. they had a person who was more than willing to carry that torch. Very much so who did it proudly and bravely, and again, a word for him was just, and his whole family, unapologetically. Yep. They just did themselves, and they did what was best for the country. Right. Um, you know, I want, I want to ask you, Congresswoman Bass, what, what do you think your legacy will be with respect to politics and political change in this country? Well, you know, I mean, my, my hope is, is that my legacy will be that I spent my life fighting for social and economic justice and did everything I could to recruit and train as many other people as possible. If you really believe, as I do, that you need a movement to bring about change, yes. then you want as many people as possible to be leaders. Yes. And to me, one of the things that I've always enjoyed the most is introducing people to politics, helping to train them, helping to empower them so that they go on and carry the torch. So at Community Coalition, I stayed there 14 years. 
Uh, when I left, the young man that took over, Marquise Harris Dawson, is now in LA City Council. That's fantastic. And, um, and we That's work fantastic. together very closely. Right. And then a number of the young people that I worked with 28 years ago, as I mentioned, they're off running organizations or doing things, but very, very much involved. And to me, that's what I get the most fulfillment fun from, and uh, that's what I hope would be my legacy. I think it's fantastic. What would you say would be the, the greatest challenges that you've had to sustain your career and to sustain your own sense of I'm making a difference no matter what? What has sustained you in that? Well, I think what sustained me is is not so much like bills that were passed or anything like that, but it's more the involvement of people right. and then um, hearing from people how it's made a difference. So, for example, you know, working on the whole issue of foster care, I mean, there's a million and one things I would like to change. Right. But the feedback I get from people all the time is that they know that I'm out there you know, uh, pushing and fighting and what a difference that means to them. Right. And that certainly helps to sustain me. Even wow. when I don't feel like I'm succeeding as much as I want to or you could. Just, you just do it. The fact that other people feel that it's impacting them and right. making a difference. Right. I, I think it's great that, that the community has someone that is about making a difference and really doing it from a soulful place of knowing that I have to get out there and do this, no matter how tired you are. How, I, I, can I share this? Is I thought it was really interesting today when, when you were talking, we first got here, about going back to Washington, D.C. And I thought, wow, what about just resting right now or focusing on some other things? And you were like, I got to get back to work. I got to make some <laughs> things happen. And I thought it was just... Uh, it just showed me a lot about you, about mm -hmm. about your work ethic, about your 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 sense of wanting to really present change and to make it happen. Um, I, j I just think you really are phenomenal. Oh, you really, thank really you. are. I, thank you. You are. I appreciate that. But, you know. you know, there is so much to be done. And I, I feel very passionately that as an African-American who has an opportunity to be in a leadership position – that it is unconscionable that I would not take that position and use it in its maximum way mm -hmm. and never use it for career advancement right. or for self-promotion. Right. Those are two things that really, I mean, if, if our community and our folks were doing great, then fine, go out and promote yourself all you want. Mm -hmm. But when things are about self-promotion and career advancement, then that's when you get off base right. and you wind up supporting issues and supporting things that do not benefit the community. Right. That's when you get seduced by the money or the right. power or the right. influence and none of that um, seduces me. Well, I tell you, I, I just, uh, your energy is so, um, what I would call anti-entitlement. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't present that feeling of even entitlement. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't have that air. Your air is one of, of community, one of, of involvement and and authenticity, you really we can just feel it. You know, I <laughs> well, really mean you. that. It, it, it's thank great. Thank you. I I appreciate that because I do believe that very deeply, mm -hmm. and I feel very honored. You know, I feel very honored and very privileged that I have the opportunity to serve in this manner. And by the way, I never thought about running for office. That was like about the last thing in the world I thought so, about. So how did, that, how did that come about then? <laughs> Kicking and hear. screaming? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't kick and scream too much. <laughs> well, uh, when I was at Community Coalition and... Um, uh, Congresswoman Diane Watson. Oh, yep. Phenomenal you know, one woman. of the leaders in our oh, community. Yes. Uh, she called me up. I didn't even know she knew me. Right. I knew her, of course. But right. she called me up and she told me that I had been in the community long enough and I needed to go up to Sacramento. And I'm like, what do I want to go up to Sacramento for? <laughs> right. And she, right. She, she said, well, there's no African-American women in the state legislature. I hadn't thought about it, but they right. all turned out. Right. They actually went to D.C., but wow. there was a void there. There, right. And so I was like, well, she said, and also one of our local labor leaders, Miguel Contreras, he said, well, just don't say no. Just think about it for a while. So I went up to Sacramento and I talked to people that I knew who were elected up there. And I said, why, does, why would anybody want to come up here? Right. And they basically told me, well, you know, you can really work on some issues. Right. And 
uh, the issues I was working on in South L.A., yes. I could work on in Sacramento. And I was like, oh, I never thought about that. Right. So I went up to Sacramento and I was working on the same issues. And my goal with Community Coalition was to create an organization, build it, train the leadership, and then leave. Because mm -hmm. one of the things in our community is we might start something and then we have a hard time letting go. Right, right, right. But to me, the real success is being able to walk away and right. have it flourish. Right. And so after 14 years, the organization was ready. And, uh, and so I went up to Sacramento. And then when I got to D.C., I'm still working on the same issues. Yes. The, the addition is, is that now I get to work on international issues Absolutely. as well as domestic. You know, uh, in, in the uh, 70s and 80s, I was working on the, uh, supporting the African liberation struggles, the independence movement yes. in yes. South Africa and Southern Africa. I was working on those issues, but I never had the resources to go to Africa. Right. And it took right. me really kind of being in Congress to be able, now I go to Africa regularly. I think it's fantastic. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. But being able to be in Washington and work on both domestic and right. uh, international right. issues is very exciting. Well, I think it's great, though. I mean, you, you, you involved with foreign affairs, involved with domestic policy here, involved with making a change in your community. It's just you're doing a lot. You, Thank you. You really do a lot. I want, I want to share with everyone, too. You know, I first had the opportunity and the honor of meeting Congresswoman Bass at the Special Olympics as a medical director for the Healthy Athletes Program, she was one of uh, two Congress, actually no, you're the only congressperson where some local uh, representatives come, but you're the only congressperson that came. So hmm. I thought that was quite an honor, you oh. know, that you took time. And you didn't just come in for like two minutes. You were there. You walked around. Yeah. You were involved. You asked questions. You talked to the athletes. I passed out was, medals. You passed out medals. <laughs> you sure did. You remember that. that you sure fun. did. Yeah. You know, so I was, in my mind, I always thought, you know, she's really walking and talking the path. Yeah. You were really doing it. Well, it was very exciting. And by the way, it was amazing meeting you and oh, some of you. the young people that you were dealing with. And I, I'm the one thing that I remembered was the miracle. I wished I could have witnessed it. Yes. When the young man who had his ears clogged, oh, yeah. a young man, he was a boy, oh, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he was. he's in his 20s. He's in his 20s. Yeah. Oh, he's a young man. So, so we, we can talk about this story briefly. Please. It was unbelievable. So we had, we had an athlete uh, from uh, a country that was unable to hear for, for years, could not hear. They thought since birth. But what happened is he had deep, deep, deep areas of cerumen, which is was wax basically, in his ears. And part of his earlobes were, were the, the tympanic membrane were not, was not working well. It was destroyed basically. So we're able to take out the wax and give him basically new tympanic membranes that work. So for the first time when they were playing basketball, he was able to hear his coach's voice. That's amazing. And could hear. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing, you know. And there were several stories like that. Oh, we had many. The kids that couldn't see. The yes. Kid, you know. The ones that couldn't walk. I just walk. had no idea. It, it's a, it's a, a very, uh, that experience was so, uh, uh, it was a life-changing one for me with respect to how blessed I am. Yes, And exactly. how it made me think of how more I can do as a person. Right. You know, like having you here today reminds me of how I can, in my mind, be a better man, a better doctor, a better physician, to be of greater service. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel that impact from you because mm -hmm. it's so sincere, it's so authentic, and you are doing the work. That's what I think is phenomenal. Well, I Bass. feel very honored and privileged to have the opportunity to do the work. Wow. We're fortunate to have you. I really mean it. We are. Thank you. I, I, I want to thank Congresswoman Bass for being with us today. She really is the epitome of, of truth, of strength, of knowledge, of authenticity, and of course, the greatest humanitarian virtue of all, I believe, and that is service. She really lives a life of service, and I, the world is just a better place for you. Well, I know it takes yeah. a lot, but I know and believe that God will continue to give you the strength <laughs> and the focus and the ability to do what you're doing because you are more than enough, and we're grateful to have you of service to us. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be on your show today. Well, thank you, Congresswoman <laughs> Bass. Well, this is Dr. Levi. You've heard it from great Congresswoman Bass. Uh, is there a website they can reach you 
if they want to yes, send... Yes, yes, yes. They could just um, Google Congresswoman Karen Bass, and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and all Instagram. of the various social media platforms. There you got it. So Congresswoman Bass is on everything, on IG, <laughs> on Facebook. You can find her. Please reach out to her. Give her your comments and let her know how she's doing such a phenomenal job and how, how much we really, really appreciate her. It's really fantastic. And uh, I just want to say thank you. That, Thank that's, you. I, I really appreciate mean that. it. Absolutely. <laughs> this is Dr. Levi. Have a great week. Remember, be kind to the veterans. Those women and men are really the, the superheroes of our, of our generation. They should be treated with respect. They should be treated with kindness. And sometimes just go and say hello to them. Yeah. A, a hello that we appreciate your service. We appreciate what you've done. You know, we don't want to see them at the side of a, uh, of a corner or by the freeway. Be kind and generous and compassionate with them. All right, this is Dr. Levi. Have a great day. And remember, if you say anything, think about three things. Is it true? Does it have to be said? And or is it uplifting? If it's none of those three, just be quiet. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>